Stanley Milgram's study of obedience. This is a, a classic in social psychology, and justifiably so. The results are surprising, or certainly they were at the time, and they captured the public imagination and still do so today. When you, when you tell people about this experiment, if they've never heard of it before, they are flat out fascinated. And even people who have heard of it can't help but go back over it. It's, it's one of those kinds of deeply unsettling but also very compelling pieces of research, I think. If you want to get a hold of a copy of it for yourself, um, you can you find a PDF of it very quickly online. Um, an elementary search using Google or, or another web browser will, you know, uh, sorry, search engine will do the same for you. So I, I got a copy of this. This is just a PDF from, um, I think this was actually hosted by Yale, I'm not sure. But it's easily obtainable and you can, you can read it all through. His style is very straightforward and very direct. His results are very easy to make sense of. Um, and some of the detail that he supplies is fascinating. So by all means, go ahead and, and have a look at it yourself. But in order to just accelerate our process through this and get to the nuts and bolts of the thing, so, <clears throat> what was he up to? Well, his aim was to test a hypothesis. And it was a very popular hypothesis after the Second World War. And it was basically this. After the Holocaust, um, and people discovered the, the, the extent of the, the monstrous behaviour that had taken place, it was really clear that you couldn't, have, you couldn't have orchestrated this on the basis of the behaviour of a limited number of sociopathically disturbed individuals. This was mechanised, industrialised destruction and required the complicity and obedience of a very large number of people. In other words, people like you and I. People who were just ordinary had to, in some way, become obedient to malign, vicious authorities. And so the popular explanation of how that could have happened was, well, there's something odd about Germans. You see, Germans, they, they just they have a tendency to be this way. Now, Milgram didn't believe all of this. He didn't go for this kind of Germans, a different theory at all. So he did the classic thing that science, science does. He, he adopted the hypothesis in order to test it to destruction, to show that it was flawed. And this is how he went about it. He recruited 40 male subjects by advertising in a local newspaper. He offered them $4 for their time and 50 cents additional for their, their travel costs. And he, um, <clears throat> he worked to deceive them into thinking they were giving electric shocks. The actual, exam, uh, the actual newspaper article looked like this, so it's a little public announcement thing. Um, you can see from the kinds of people he's looking at, he's not preferring, the, like the classic thing, he's not preferring undergrads or, or students. He's looking for something like a representative range. Of course, there's a bias built in that they're all men and that they all come from in and around the New Haven area, Eastern Seaboard of America, so that they're likely to be more predominantly white uh, European heritage. But what he's doing is he's trying to build up a baseline assessment of what normal obedience would look like. And then he's, the theory was he was going to go to Germany and do the whole thing all over again and make a comparison to see was there a difference in the levels of obedience exhibited on the eastern seaboard of America with, say, mainland European Germany. If the hypothesis was true, obviously you'd expect there to be a higher level of obedience in Germany. If the hypothesis was false, you'd expect there to be no difference. Actually, it turned out he didn't need to go beyond America. You'll see why. So the subjects were told that the study was all about punishment in learning, and they took the role of a teacher. And when they arrived, there was another apparent subject there who seemed to be responding to the advert, and an apparent experimenter. Although in practice, neither of these things were true. The other person, the other subject, was a confederate, knew what the game was, was in on the whole deal. And the experimenter wasn't the experimenter at all, but merely took the role of the authority figure. They then presented the, uh, the two participants with pieces of paper to choose at random. They always made sure that, um, that the pieces of paper had the same words on, so the, the, piece of word, the piece of paper always said teacher. So when the live, the real participant, opened their piece of paper, they seemed to have been given the role of teacher. They were then told that the participants would be testing one another, you know, the, the learner would be tested on their ability to recall a pair of words. So I would say one word and he would say another one back. So <coughs> the teacher would administer a shock for every incorrect answer. They were sat down in front of the shock generator machine with 30 switches. 
the top level of which registered at 450 volts, and the subject saw the Confederates strapped into a chair in an adjoining room. There were electrodes attached to their arms, conductive paste was applied to their skin, so it was ostensibly not to burn them, but also to like, serve the emphasis that this is for real. Uh, before they took part in the experiment at all, the teacher was given a, uh, a, an electric shock to sort of show them what it felt like. They were given a 45 uh, volt electric shock. Um, it looked like it came from, from the shock generator, but actually it came from a, an independently wired battery. So that's, that was how the whole thing was set up. Initially, the Confederate answered the questions correctly, but when they'd made some mistakes, the subject starts to administer 15 volt shocks. Every time a mistake's made, the voltage goes up by further 15 volts. If at any point they became unwilling to raise the voltage or administer the shock, they, the researcher would encourage them by repeating a standardized set of phrases that emphasized the lack of choice and the importance of continuing. I'm just going to quickly see if I can show you those phrases here. Um, there they are. He called them prods. So if the subject indicated his unwillingness to go on, the experimenter responded with a sequence of prods. Please go on. Or please continue or please go on. The experiment requires you continue. It's absolutely essential you continue. You have no other choice. And if they were, if required, you, you could use these specialist ones. <clears throat> so you could say, if the subject asked the learner was liable to suffer permanent injury, the experimenter said, although the shocks may be painful, there's no permanent damage to tissue, so please go on. Uh, followed by two and three and four again. And if the subject... Uh, said that the learner didn't want to go on, then the, the experimenter would say, whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly. So please go on, followed by the prods again. So that was all the armament that the experimenter used to persuade the participant to continue. The process was repeated until either the subject refused to continue or they reached the 450 volt point, which they repeated up to four times. That was the end of the experiment critically important. At no point was anyone actually shocked, aside from in that first instance where a 45 volt electric shock was administered to the live participant so that they would believe in the equipment. And once they'd finished there was a thorough debrief uh, and a reconciliation meeting with the learner so that the person walked away knowing that no harm had been done and no hard feelings were felt and they were also reassured that their behaviour was normal. Findings then. All the subjects, all 40 of them, went to at least 300 volts. Before he started, Milgram had canvassed uh, freshman, no, sorry, third year undergraduate students who were taking at least a major in psychology, if not their, their single honours in psychology, and asked them what percentage of the population would comply, be obedient. And their answer was around about 1 to 2 percent. Similarly, he canvassed the opinions of uh, colleagues and got a similar result. These were highly informed specialist psychiatrists in the field. <coughs> Five out of the 40 subjects refused to continue beyond the 300 volts. Then a further four dropped out at the 315 volts. Two more refused to continue at 330. And then one at 345, one at 360 and one at 375 respectively. But what you've got to remember here is... The 300 volts was the critical point. That was the point the learner had already complained about his heart, had started to refuse to answer any further questions, and had hammered on the wall. So at this point they've gone quiet. So the remaining 26 subjects continued to administer the increasing levels of shock up to the 450 volts, and then three more times, four in total. Those who dropped out at any point were counted as disobedient, and they came to 35% of the sample. 65%, roughly two-thirds, administered the full range of shocks. And those are the quantitative responses, results that we've got. Whilst the, the procedures were being administered, most subjects exhibited signs of anxiety and later reported finding the procedures stressful or very stressful. And we were talking about things like people tugging at earlobes, biting fingernails, sweating more profusely, hands trembling, people becoming really quite disturbed. During the debriefing interview, the majority of subjects said that they believed the experiment was valuable and that they had learned things about themselves that were important. One year later, an independent psychiatric assessment of all, adverse, of all subjects was carried out and none were found to be suffering adverse mental health problems 
that could be attributed to their participation in Milgram's experiment. And that's the qualitative data there. So people believed that it was important, they believed that they'd found out important stuff about themselves, and you couldn't show that they'd suffered any psychological harm as a consequence of it. So Milgram draws the conclusion that under the right circumstances, most people will obey orders against their conscience. And on the face of it, there's a very coherent, strong position that he's, he's worked his way to there. So here's the evaluations. First of all, ethical issues. Milgram's procedures necessarily involve deception of his subjects. You can't do a Milgram-type experiment and let people in on it because they just the behaviour would be influenced. So, <clears throat> is deception permissible? Well, under certain circumstances. If the hypothesis being tested is considered to be very important and the deception is necessary, then provided adequate safeguards are put in place to protect people from damage done by the deception, it's possible to get ethical approval. And we still see, or we certainly have seen, subsequent to these first round of experiments, other Milgram-type experiments being conducted throughout the 60s and the 70s. It's often argued that Milgram's procedures risk significant psychological harm to his subjects. Um, and that would be because he was supposed to be revealing things that they didn't like about themselves or they couldn't cope with. But you've got to remember, the vast majority of participants said that they thought the research was valuable and that they'd found important things out about themselves and that subsequently independent psychiatric assessment couldn't show that there'd been any significant harm caused. So maybe this kind of, you know, we look at it and we go, oh, monstrous, how could you possibly do that to somebody? Maybe telling people or, or helping them to see that they are capable of, of terrible things, maybe it's not that bad. You know, maybe, maybe we're tougher stuff than we believe ourselves to be. Right, so then we've got more stock sort of evaluative commentary. Demand characteristics. So Orn and Holland in the late 60s claimed that most of the subjects in the obedience experiments didn't believe the shocks were real. They pointed out that if you'd gone to a, a stage magician, the stage magician would put on a hell of a performance proving that the guillotine he was going to use in his trick was sharp and capable of chopping a cabbage in half or whatever. Then he asks for a volunteer from the audience and the volunteer comes forward. Everybody but everybody knows is not going to get nobody's going to get hurt and even though everybody but everybody knows the, the volunteer could still exhibit signs of anxiety and nervousness so maybe it's like that maybe that's what's going on here that really the milgram type experiment is is just another kind of you know magic show milgram wasn't terribly impressed with this line of criticism so he he'd said that the the feigned sweating the trembling the stuttering the impact the psychological and physiological impact was too great and it would be like saying that somebody could have physiological symptoms of disease just to keep their physician busy. You know, it's, it's a ridiculous idea. Um, Orn and Holland also criticised Milgram's procedures because of their lack of mundane realism. The, the, the lab was clearly a lab. The situation was clearly artificial and, and highly unusual. So any data you get from it doesn't bear close comparison with what people are like in the real world. Now that line of criticism stands up for any kind of lab procedure, but we can refer to Hoffling's field study, which doesn't have those kinds of problems built into it. So he tests a bunch of nurses and sees how obedient they are to potentially dangerous instructions from doctors they've never heard of before. You can look up the Hoffling study yourself. Hoffling found that 21 out of the 22 nurses obeyed. Now, it has been said since then that other people have criticised Hoffling and said that he lacks ecological validity. So maybe there is a problem here anyway. But there, there would seem to be some support for, for Milgram's procedures and findings. And finally, in a later variation of his original experimental design, Milgram relocated his laboratory downtown to Bridgewater in an office with no clear connection to the university. Under these conditions, he found that more people were willing to be disobedient, but still about a half of his participants administered the full range of shocks. So all in all, I don't think we can say that Milgram has been shown to be flawed, but neither can we show that he has it all his own way. 